Surely, if there was some safe, simple, side effect free solution to the obesity epidemic, we'd know about it by now, right? Well, I'm not so sure. It may take an average of 17 years before research findings make it into day to day clinical practice. To take one example that was particularly poignant for my family, heart disease. Decades ago, Dr. Dean Ornish and colleagues published evidence in one of the most prestigious medical journals in the world that our leading cause of death could be reversed with diet and lifestyle changes alone, yet hardly anything changed. In fact, even now, hundreds of thousands of Americans continue to needlessly die from what we learned decades ago was a reversible condition. I had seen it with my own eyes. My grandmother was cured of her end-stage heart disease by one of Dean's contemporaries, Nathan Pritikin, using similar methods. She was given a medical death sentence at age 65, but thanks to a healthy diet, was able to enjoy another 31 years on this planet until age 96 to continue to enjoy her six grandkids, including me. To our number one killer could get lost down some rabbit hole and ignored. What else might there be buried in the medical literature that could help my patients, uh, but just didn't have a corporate budget driving its promotion? Well, I made it my life's mission to find out. That's why I went to medical school in the first place, and why I started my nonprofit site, nutritionfacts.org. Everything on the website is free. There are no ads, no corporate sponsorships, strictly non-commercial, not selling anything, just put it up as a public service as a labor of love, as a tribute to my grandmother. New videos and articles nearly every day are the latest in evidence-based nutrition. What a concept. <laughs> okay, so what does the science show is the best way to lose weight? If testimonials and before and after pictures, you have come to the wrong place. I'm not interested in anecdotes. I'm interested in evidence. When it comes to making decisions as life and death important as to what to feed yourself and your family, there's really only one question. What does the best available balance of evidence say right now? The problem is that even just sticking with the peer-reviewed medical literature is not enough, as false and scientifically unsupported beliefs about obesity are pervasive even in scientific journals. So the only way to get the truth in is to dive deep into the primary literature and read all the original studies themselves. But who's got time for that? There are more than a half million scientific papers on obesity in the medical literature with a hundred new ones published every day. But that's what we do at NutritionFacts.org. We comb through tens of thousands of studies a year, so busy folks like you don't have to. Very nice. <laughs> and indeed, we uncovered a uh, treasure trove of buried data, like, for example, today I'll cover simple spices proven in randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials to accelerate weight loss for just pennies a day. But with so little profit potential, it's no wonder that these studies never saw the light of day. The only profiting I care about, though, is your health. That's why 100% of the proceeds from all my books, speaking engagements, DVDs, everything, all goes to charity. I just want to do for everyone's family what Pritikin did for my family. But wait, isn't weight loss just about eating less and moving more? I mean, isn't a calorie a calorie? That's what the food industry wants you to think. The notion that one calorie, a uh, calorie from one source is just as fattening as a calorie from any other is a trope broadcast by the food industry to absolve itself of cul culpability. Coca-Cola even put out an ad emphasizing this one simple common sense fact. As the current and past chairs of Harvard's nutrition department put it, this central argument from industry is that the overconsumption of calories from carrots would be no different than the overconsumption of calories from soda. I mean, if a calorie is just a calorie, why does it matter what kind of foods we put in our mouth? 
Well, let's explore that example of carrots versus Coca-Cola. Well, tightly controlled laboratory setting, 240 calories of carrots, 10 carrots, would have the same effect on calorie balance than the 240 calories in a bottle of Coke. That comparison falls flat on its face out in the real world. You could chug those liquid candy calories down in less than a minute, but eating 240 calories of carrots would take you more than two and a half hours of constant chewing. It's actually been tested. <laughs> Not only would your jaw get sore, but 240 calories of carrots, that's five cups of carrots. I mean, you might not be even able to fit them all in your stomach, right? Our stomach is only so big. I mean, once we fill it up, there's stretch receptors in our stomach wall that tell us when we've had enough. But different foods have different amount of calories per stomachful. Some foods have more calories per cup, per pound, per mouthful than others. This is the concept of calorie density, the number of calories in a given amount of food. So as you can see, for example, oil has a high calorie density. That means a high calorie concentration, lots of calories packed into a small space. So drizzling a you know, tablespoon of oil onto uh, a dish adds over 100 calories. I mean, for those same calories, you could have instead eaten about two cups of blackberries, for example, a food with a low calorie density. So these two meals have the same number of calories. I mean, you can swig down that spoonful of oil and not even feel a difference in your stomach. But you know, eating a couple cups of berries, you can imagine how that could start to fill you up. That's why, yes, biochemically, a calorie is a calorie. But eating the same amount of calories in different forms can have different effects. The average human stomach can expand to fit about four cups of food. So a single stomach full of strawberry ice cream, for example, could max out our caloric intake for the entire day. To get those same 2,000 calories from strawberries themselves, you'd have to eat 44 cups of strawberries. I mean, as delicious as berries are. I mean, so that's 11 stomach full. Right? As delicious as berries are, I don't think I could, you know, pack my stomach to bursting 11 times a day. I mean, see, some foods are just impossible to overeat. They're so low in calorie dense that you physically couldn't even eat enough to maintain your weight. Right? So yeah, in a lab, a calorie is a calorie, but in life, Far from it. Traditional weight loss approaches focus on decreasing portion size. But we know these eat less approaches can leave people feeling unsatisfied and hungry. Uh, a more effective approach may be to move away from this restrictive messaging and to positive eat more messaging of, of increasing one's intake of healthy, low-calorie density foods. But you don't know until you Put it to the test. Indeed, researchers in Hawaii tried putting people on a more traditional Hawaiian diet with all the plant foods they could eat. Unlimited quantities of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and beans. And the study subjects lost an average of 17 pounds in just 21 days. Calorie intake dropped 40%, but not because they're eating less food. Uh, they lost 17 pounds in three weeks eating more food, in excess of four pounds of food a day. How could that be? Because whole plant foods tend to be so calorically dilute, you can stuff yourself without getting the same kind of weight gain. They lost 17 pounds in three weeks eating more food. That's why in my new book, How Not to Diet, which I am very excited about, <laughs> That's why low in calorie density is on my list of the 17 ingredients for a ideal weight loss diet. Since Americans average about three pounds of food a day, if you stuck with mostly these foods, you could see how you could eat more food and still lose 
waves. Vegetables have the lowest calorie density, and so researchers at Penn State decided to put it to the test. Study subjects were served pasta and told to eat as much or as little pasta as they'd like, and on average they consumed about 900 calories of pasta. Uh, now, what do you think would happen if, as a first course, they were fed 100 calories of salad, composed largely of lettuce, carrots, cucumbers, celery, and cherry tomatoes? Would they go on to eat the same amount of, um, uh, of pasta and end up with a 1,000 calorie lunch, 900 plus 100? Or would they eat 100 fewer calories of the pasta, effectively canceling out the salad calories? It was even better than that. They ate more than 200 fewer calories of pasta. Thanks to the salad, 100 calories in, 200 calories out. So in essence, the salad had negative 100 calories. Preloading with vegetables can effectively subtract calories out of a meal. Now, of course, the type of salad matters. Researchers repeated the experiment, but this time added a fatty dressing and shredded cheese, which quadrupled the salad's calorie density. Now, eating this salad as a first course, it didn't turn a 900 calorie meal into one with eight, then less than 800 calories. Instead, it turned it into a meal with calories in the quadruple digits, right? It's like uh, preloading pizza with garlic bread or something. You're just gonna end up with more calories overall. So what's the cutoff? Well, studies on preloading uh, show that eating about a cup of food before a meal decreases subsequent intake by about 100 calories. So to get a negative calorie of in fact, um, the first course would have to contain fewer than 100 calories per cup. So as you can see in the chart here, that includes most fresh fruits and vegetables, but eating something like a dinner roll simply would not work. But hey, giving people a large apple to eat before that same pasta meal, rather than consuming about 200 calories less, it was more like 300 calories less. So, how many, apple, how many calories does an apple have? It depends on when you eat it. Before a meal, an apple can effectively have negative 200 calories. You see the same thing giving people vegetable soup. But as a first course, hundreds of calories disappear. One study even tracked people's intake throughout the entire day and found that overweight subjects randomized to pre-lunch vegetable soup not only ate less lunch, but deducted an extra bonus 100 calories at dinner too, a whole seven hours later. So the next time you sit down to some healthy soup, you can imagine calories being veritably sucked from your system. <laughs> even just drinking two cups of water immediately before a meal costs people to eat about 20% less, taking about 100 fewer calories. No wonder why overweight men and women, randomized to two cups of water before each meal, lost weight 44% faster. Two cups of water before each meal, 44% faster weight loss. But who's going to put an ad on the TV for tap water, right? Um, there's just no profit to be made. That's why in my negative calorie preloading um, is on my list of weight loss boosters. So these are all the things I can find that can accelerate weight loss, um, regardless of what you eat the rest of the time. Anything we can put on that first course salad to accelerate fat loss even further? Well, in my amping AMPK section, I talk about ways to activate an enzyme known as the fat controller. Its discovery is considered one of the most important medical breakthroughs over the last few decades. You can activate this enzyme through exercise, fasting, or nicotine. But loss without sweat, hunger, or the whole dying a horrific death from lung cancer thing, well, Big Pharma is all over it. After all, obese individuals may be unwilling to perform even a minimum of physical activity, wrote a group of pharmacologists, thus indicating that drugs mimicking endurance exercise are highly desirable. So, it's crucial that all compounds with high bioavailability are developed to safely induce chronic AMP activation for long-term weight loss and maintenance, but... There is no need to develop such a compound since you can buy it at any grocery store. It's called vinegar. 
when vinegar, acetic acid, is absorbed and metabolized, we get a natural AMPK boost. Enough of a boost to actually lose weight at a typical dose you might get dressing a salad? Well, look, vinegar has been used for centuries as a weight loss remedy, but only recently has it been put to the test. A randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial on the effects of vinegar intake on the reduction of body fat in overweight men and women. The subjects were randomized to a daily, uh, drink a daily beverage containing one to two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar, or a placebo control group drinking a beverage developed to taste like the vinegar drink, but made with a different kind of acid, so it didn't have any actual vinegar in it. Three months in, the fake vinegar group actually gained weight, as you know, uh, overweight individuals tend to do, whereas the genuine vinegar groups um, significantly lost body fat, as determined by CT scan. A little vinegar a day led to pounds of weight loss achieved for just pennies a day without removing anything from their diets. That's why one of my 21 tweaks to accelerate weight loss is two teaspoons of vinegar with every meal, either sprinkled onto a salad or just you know, added to some hot uh, tea with lemon juice or something. The vinegar studies were nice because they were placebo controlled. That's very difficult to do because people tend to notice what they're putting in their mouth. I mean, you can't stuff a cabbage into a capsule, but some foods are so potent, you can actually stuff them into a capsule to, to pit them head to head against placebo um, sugar pills, and they're called spices. Want to know if garlic can cause weight loss? Well, simple. Just uh, give people some garlic powder pills versus placebo pills, and garlic worked, resulting in both a uh, drop in weight and waistlines within six weeks. They used half a teaspoon of garlic powder a day, and that would cost about four cents. If four cents is too steep, how about two cents a day, a quarter teaspoon of garlic powder? About 100 overweight men and women were randomized to a quarter teaspoon of garlic powder a day or placebo, and those unknowingly taking the two cents worth of garlic powder a day lost about six pounds of straight body fat over the next 15 weeks. Now, if you can splurge up to three there's black human. A meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials shows weight loss efficacy with, again, just a quarter teaspoon a day. What is black human? You obviously have not been reading your Bible. Described as a miracle herb, besides the weight loss, there are randomized controlled trials showing daily black human consumption significantly improves cholesterol and triglycerides significantly improves blood pressure and blood sugar control, but I use it just because it tastes good. It's just a spice. You can put black cumin seeds in a pepper grinder and just use it like black pepper. With more than a thousand papers published in the peer-reviewed medical literature on black cumin, some reporting extraordinary results like dropping cholesterol levels as much as a statin drug, why don't we hear more about it? Why wasn't I taught about it in medical school? Well, presumably, because there's no profit motive. Black cumin is just a natural spice, right? Common spice. You're not going to thrill your stockholders selling something you can't patent that costs three cents a day. Or you could use regular cumin, acts as an appetite suppressant. Those randomized to a half teaspoon of both lunch and dinner over three months lost about four more pounds and an extra inch off their waist, found comparable to the obesity drug known as Orlistat. Uh, that's the uh, anal leakage drug you may have heard about. <laughs> Though the drug company apparently prefers the term fecal spotting to <laughs> describe the rectal discharge it causes. The drug company's website, though, offers some helpful tips. It's probably a smart idea to wear <laughs> and bring a change of clothes with you to work. You know, just in case your drug causes you to crap your pants at work. 
I, I think I'll stick with the cumin. Thank you very much. Cayenne pepper can counteract the metabolic slowing that accompanies weight loss and accelerate fat burning as a bonus. Ginger powder, over a dozen randomized controlled trials, starting just a quarter teaspoon a day. Prove, again, uh, so significantly decreased body weight for pennies a day. Proven in placebo controlled trials to work, but we've never heard about any of this because it doesn't make enough profit. My section on fat blocking foods starts out with the command to eat your thylakoids doctor's orders. What on earth is a thylakoid? Well, just the source of nearly all known life and the oxygen we breathe, thylakoids are where photosynthesis takes place, the process by which plants turn light into food. Thylakoids are the great green engine of life, microscopic sac-like structures composed of chlorophyll-rich membranes concentrated in the leaves of plants. When we eat thylakoids, when you bite into a leaf of spinach, for example, those green leaf membranes don't immediately get digested. They can last for hours in our intestines, and that's where they work their magic. Thylakoid membranes bind to lipase. Uh, lipase is the enzyme our body uses to digest fat. So if you bind the enzyme, you can slow fat digestion. Uh, well, wait a second. If all the fat is eventually absorbed, though, what's the benefit? Location, location, location. There's a phenomenon known as the ileal break. The ileum is the last part of the small intestine before it dumps into the colon. Um, and when undigested calories are detected that far down in your intestines, your body thinks, oh, I must be full from stem to stern, and puts the brakes on eating more by dialing down your appetite. You can show this experimentally. You insert a nine-foot tube down people's throats, and you drip down any kind of calories, fat, protein, sugar, and you can activate the ileal break. Then you sit them down to an all-you-can-eat meal, and compared to the placebo group that just got a little squirt of water through the tube, um, uh, they eat over 100 calories less. They just don't feel as hungry. They feel just as full, eating significantly less. That's the ileal break in action. This can then translate into weight loss. Randomize overweight women to a diet of green plant membranes, which just means they covertly slip them some spinach powder, and you get a boost in appetite suppressing hormones, a decreased urge for sweets, a decreased urge for chocolate. Look at this. Um, uh, six, seven hours later, um, those who had been slipped some spinach seven hours earlier, um, uh, just chocolate doesn't do much for them. Um, they just kind of eh, take it or leave it. Same thing with sweets. Um, and indeed, um, boom, you get accelerated weight loss thanks to eating green. The actual green itself, the uh, chlorophyll-packed membranes in the leaves. Now, the researchers use spinach powder just so they can create convincing-looking placebos, but we can get just as many thylakoids eating a half cup of cooked greens, which is what I recommend people eat twice a day in my daily dozen checklist of all the healthiest of healthy foods I encourage people to fit into their daily routine. In the Journal of the Society of Chemical Industry, a group of food technologists argue that given their fat-blocking benefits, thylakoid membranes could be incorporated into functional foods as a promising new appetite-reducing ingredient, or you can just get them the way Mother Nature intended. Though thylakoids are eventually broken down, fiber makes it all the way down to our colon. And while it's technically true we can't digest fiber, that's only applicable to the part of us that's actually human. Most of the cells in our body are actually bacteria. Our gut flora, um, which weighs as much as one of our kidneys, as metabolically active as our liver, has been called our forgotten organ. And it's an organ that runs on MAC, microbiotic accessible carbohydrates. So when you see me th write things like, eat lots of Big Macs, don't get the wrong idea. MAC is just another name for prebiotics. What our good gut flora eat, in other words, fiber. 
what do our good bacteria do with fiber? Well, we feed them and they feed us right back. They make short chain fatty acids that get absorbed from our colon into our bloodstream, circulate throughout our body and even up into our brain. It's like our, the way our gut flora communicate with us, dialing down our appetite, all the while increasing the rate at which we burn fat and boosting our metabolism at the same time, all thanks to fiber. Check this out. Put people on a brain scanner and show them a high calorie food like a donut and the reward centers in their brains instantly light up. But if you repeat the experiment, but this time secretly deliver fiber-derived short-chain fatty acids directly into their rectum, <laughs> you get a blunted reward center response. Uh, the subjects report that high-calorie foods just seem less appealing, and subsequently they ate less of an all-you-can-eat meal. But fiber supplements like Metamucil don't work, which makes sense because they're non-fermentable, meaning our good gut flora can't eat it. So yeah, it can improve bowel regularity, but um, uh, can't be uh, used to make those compounds that block our cravings. For that, you have to actually eat real food. What a concept. Our good gut bugs are trying to help us, but when we eat a diet deficient in fiber, we are in effect starving our microbial self. Less than 5% of Americans reach even the recommended minimum daily intake of fiber. No surprise since the number one sources are whole grains and legumes, which are beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils. And 96% of Americans don't even reach the recommended minimum daily intake of beans, and 99% of Americans don't reach the recommended minimum daily intake of whole grains. Most people don't even know what fiber is. More than half of Americans surveyed think steak is a significant source of fiber. However, by de definition, fiber is only found in plants. There is zero fiber in meat, eggs, or dairy, and typically little or no fiber in processed junk, and therein lies the problem. But wouldn't at least that protein in the steak be satiating? Wouldn't it fill you up? Well, surprisingly, even a review supported by the meat, dairy, and egg industries acknowledged that protein intake does not actually translate into eating less later on, whereas you eat a fiber-rich whole grain for supper, and it can cut your calorie intake more than 12 hours later at lunch the next day. You feel, about, you feel full about 100 calories quicker the following day because by then, your good gut bugs are feasting on that same bounty that you had the night before, dialing down your appetite. Today, even our meat could be considered junk food for more than the century. One of the major goals of animal agriculture has been to increase the carcass fat content of farm animals. Take chicken, for example. You know, 100 years ago, the USDA determined that chicken was about 23% protein by weight and less than 2% fat. Today, chickens have been genetically manipulated through selective breeding to have 10 times more fat. In fact, more fat than protein now. Chicken little has become chicken big and may be making us bigger too. How meat consumption in general is associated with weight gain, but poultry appeared to be the worst. Even just an ounce a day, we're talking a single chicken nugget, or like you know one chicken breast every 10 days, was associated with weight gain compared to eating no chicken at all. You know, it's funny, when the meat industry funds obesity studies on chicken, they choose for their head-to-head -head comparisons foods like cookies and sugar-coated chocolate. See, this is a classic drug industry trick where you try to make your product look better by comparing it to something substandard. You know, apparently just regular chocolate wasn't enough butter. But what happens when you pit chicken against the real control like chicken without the actual chicken? Chicken, chicken's out. Both tofu and corn, a, a plant-based meat made from the mushroom kingdom, were found to have stronger satiating qualities than chicken. Feed people a chicken and rice lunch and four and a half hours later, they eat 18% more calories of a dinner uh, than those who had instead been given a lunch of chicken free 
chicken, and rice. These findings are consistent with uh, um, childhood obesity research pu published, if you can see that, by the Adventists, um, showing that meat consumption appeared to double the odds of school children becoming overweight compared to the consumption of plant-based meat products. Now, of course, whole food sources of, of plant protein, such as beans, did even better, associated with cutting in half the risk of children becoming overweight. So that's why I consider these kinds of uh, you know, plant-based meats more as a useful stepping stone towards a healthier diet rather than the end game ideal. Part of the reason plant-based meats are less fattening is they cause less of an insulin spike. A chicken-free chicken like corn causes up to 41% less of an immediate insulin reaction. It turns out animal protein causes almost exactly as much insulin release as pure sugar. Just adding some egg whites to your diet can increase insulin output as much as 60% within four days, and fish may be even worse. Wait a second. <laughs> Sorry to be the messenger. <laughs> Why, wait a second. Why would adding tuna uh, to mashed potatoes spike up insulin levels, but adding broccoli instead cut the insulin response by about 40%? Well, it's not the fiber, since giving the same amount of broccoli fiber alone provide no significant benefit. So wait a second. Why does animal protein make things worse if a plant protein make things better? Well, plant proteins tend to be lower in the branch chain amino acids, which are associated with insulin resistance, the cause of type 2 diabetes. You can show this experimentally. You give some vegans branch chain amino acids, and you can make them as insulin resistant as omnivores, or take some omnivores, put them even through a 48-hour um, vegan diet challenge. Within two days, you can see the opposite, significant improvements in metabolic health within two days. Why? Because decreased consumption of branched-chain amino acids improves metabolic health. Check this out. Those randomized to restrict their protein intake were averaging literally hundreds of more calories per day. So they should have become fatter, right? But no, they actually lost more body fat. Restricting their protein enabled them to eat more calories, while at the same time they lost more weight, right? More calories, yet a loss in body fat. And this magic protein restriction, they were just having people eat the recommended amount of protein. So, uh, so maybe this should have been called the you know, normal protein group or the recommended protein group. And the group that was eating more typical American protein levels and suffering because of it, the excess protein group. Given the metabolic harms of excess branched chain amino acid exposure, leaders in the field have suggested the invention of drugs to block their absorption to promote metabolic health and treat diabetes and obesity without reducing caloric intake. Or we can just try not to eat so many branched chain amino acids in the first place. Where are they found? They're found mostly in meat, including chicken and fish, dairy products and eggs, perhaps explaining why animal protein has been associated with increased diabetes risk, whereas plant protein appears protective. So, defining the appropriate upper limits of animal protein intake may offer a great chance for the prevention of type 2 diabetes and obesity, but it need not be all or nothing. Even an intermittent vegan diet may be beneficial. If there was one piece of advice that best sums up the recommendations in my new book, How Not to Diet, it would be to wall off your calories. Let me explain what that means. See, animal cells are encased only in easily digestible membranes, which allow the enzymes in our gut to effortlessly liberate the calories within a steak, for example. Right? But uh, plant cells, on the other hand, have cell walls that are made out of fiber, which acts as an indigestible physical barrier, so many of the calories remain trapped inside. Now, processed plant foods, fruit juice, 
uh, sugar, refined grains, even whole grains, if they've been powdered into flour, have had their cellular structure destroyed. Their cell walls cracked open, and their calories are free for the taking. But when we eat structurally intact plant foods, chew all you want, you're still going to end up with calories completely encapsulated by fiber, thereby blunting the glycemic uh, load, uh, activating the ileal break, and providing sustenance to your friendly flora. So, bottom line, try to make sure as many of your calories as possible, your protein, your carbs, your fat, are encased in cell walls. In other words, from whole intact plant foods. That's what nature intended to happen. Millions of years before we learned how to sharpen spears, and mill grains, and boil sugarcane, our entire physiology is presumed to have evolved in the context of eating what the rest of our great ape cousins eat, plants. The Paleolithic period, which uh, when we started using tools only goes back about two million years. We know the great apes have been evolving since back in the Miocene era 20 million years ago. So for the first 90% of our hominoid existence, our bodies evolved on mostly plants. It's no wonder then why our bodies may thrive best on the diet we were designed to eat, so maybe we should go back to our roots. <clears throat> With an anyone can lose weight. Lock someone in a closet, you can force them to lose as much body fat as you want. Chaining someone to a treadmill could have a similar effect. But what's the most effective weight loss regimen that doesn't involve calorie restriction or exercise or a felony? Well, <laughs> I have scoured through the medical literature at all the randomized control trials, and the single most successful strategy to date is a diet of whole plant foods. The single most effective weight loss intervention like that ever literature, a whole food plant-based diet that works better than anything else studied to date. And no wonder, given what we just learned about the fiber and branching amino acids and all that. I mean, look, we've known for more than 40 years that those eating predominantly plant-based um, uh, weigh on average about 30 pounds less than the general population. But you don't know if it's the diet itself until you put it to the test. In 2017, a group of New Zealand researchers published the Broad Study, a 12-week randomized controlled trial in the poorest region of the country with the highest rates of obesity. Over at individuals were randomized to receive either standard medical care or semi-weekly classes offering advice and encouragement to eat a low-fat diet centered around fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and beans, and legumes. And that's all it was, just empowerment with knowledge. No meals were provided. They were just informed about the benefits of plant-based eating and encouraged to incorporate it into their own lives. No significant change in the control group, but the plant-based group, without any restrictions on portions and being able to freely eat all the healthy foods they wanted, lost an average of 19 pounds by the end of the three-month study. 19 pounds, that's a pretty respectable weight loss. But, you know, uh, what happened next? Right at the end of those 12 weeks, class was dismissed and no more instruction was given. I mean, the researchers were curious how much weight the subjects then gained back after being released from the study. So everyone was invited back at the six-month mark to get reweighed. Yes, the plant-based group had left the three-month study 19 pounds later, but after six months, they were only down about 27 better. See, the plant-based group was feeling so good, both physically and mentally, were able to come off so many of their medications that they were sticking with the diet on their own, and the weight continued to come off. All right, what about a year later? You know, even in studies that last a whole year, where people are counseled to stay on a particular diet the entire time, any initial pounds lost in the first few months tends to creep on back. But the, look, the broad study only lasted three months, yet after it was all over, those who had been randomized to the plant-based group not only lost dozens of pounds, they kept it off. They not only achieved greater weight loss in six and 12 months than any other comparable trial, that was months after the study had already ended. Right? Um, so a whole food plant-based diet achieved the greatest weight loss ever recorded compared to any other such intervention published in the medical literature. You can read the record-breaking study in full for free at uh, nature.com slash articles slash NUTD2173 or just point your phone cameras at the screen and pick off the QR code.
any diet that results in reduced caloric intake can result in weight loss. I mean, dropping pounds isn't so much the issue. The issue is keeping it off. And a key difference between plant-based nutrition and more traditional approaches to weight loss is that people are encouraged to eat ad libitum, which means eat as much as you want. No calorie counting, no portion control, just eating. The goal is to improve the quality of food rather than restricting the quantity of food. If you put people on the diet packed with fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and beans, and allow them to eat as much as they want, they go on, end up eating about 50% fewer calories than they otherwise might have, right? Just as full on half the calories. Wait a second, how can you keep people satisfied slashing more than 1,000 calories out of their daily diets? How do you do it? You do it by eating more high bulk, low calorie density foods, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and beans, and fewer calorie dense foods like meats, cheeses, sugars, and fat. But it may not just be the calories in side of the equation. Those eating more plant-based appear to effectively be burning more calories in their sleep. The resting metabolic rate of those eating more plant-based may be 10% higher or more. A boost of metabolism that can translate into burning off hundreds of extra calories a day without doing a thing. Right? Eating more plant-based, you burn more calories just being alive, just existing. Right? So no wonder why those who eat more plant-based tend to be slimmer. This is from the Adventist 2 study. Start packing your diet with real food that grows out of the ground, and the pounds should come off naturally, taking you down towards your ideal weight. But what about ketogenic diets? Body fat loss actually slows down when you switch to a ketogenic diet because your body starts cannibalizing its own protein. Just looking at the bathroom scale, though, the keto diet seems like a smashing success, losing less than a pound a week on the regular diet to, boom, three and a half pounds within seven days after switching to keto. But what was happening inside their bodies told a totally different story. On the ketogenic diet, the rate of body fat loss was slowed by more than half. So most of what they were using, losing was water, but they were also losing protein. They were also losing lean mass. This may help explain why the leg muscles of CrossFit trainees shrink by as much as 8% within two months. Exercise is supposed to make your muscles bigger, not smaller. Of course, look, even if keto diets worked, the point of weight loss is not to fit into a skinnier casket. <laughs> People whose diets even tend to trend that way appear to live significantly shorter lives. On the other hand, even just drifting in the direction of eating more healthy whole plant foods is associated with living longer. Now those going the other way, and this again is um, from the Adventist 2 study, those, go, those who start out more plant-based but then add meat back to their diet at least once a week or more, not only appear to double or triple their odds of diabetes, stroke, heart disease, and weight gain, but appear to suffer an associated 3.6 year drop in life expectancy. That's going from no meat to just once a week meat or more. Low-carb diets have been shown to impair artery function, and worsen heart disease, whereas whole food plant-based diets have been shown to actually reverse heart disease. That's what Ornish used. So what appears to be the most effective weight loss diet just so happens to be the only diet ever proven to reverse heart disease in the majority of patients, a, uh, a diet centered around whole plant foods. Right? If my grandma didn't have to die like that, maybe no one's grandma has to die like that. Right? If that's all the number one killer of men and women. Uh, shouldn't that kind of be the default diet to prove otherwise? And the fact that can also be so effective in preventing, arresting, reversing other leading killers like type 2 diabetes and high blood pressure would seem to make the case for plant-based eating simply overwhelming. It's only one diet ever been proven to do all that. We don't have to mortgage our health to lose weight. The single healthiest diet also bears the most effective diet for weight loss. You know, after all, permanent weight loss 
requires permanent dietary change. Healthier habits just have to become a way of life. And if they're going to be lifelong, you want them to lead to a long life. Thankfully, the single best diet proven for weight loss may just so happen to be the safest, cheapest way to eat for the longest, healthiest life. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. All right. Let's do some questions. While we're having a few questions for Dr. Greger, as you know, this is a free event. But the blessing of Dr. Greger being here today can be passed on to a blessing of health in the community. We have a free medical dental hope clinic, and anything that you donate today to that clinic will be used for free medical care in this community. It's the hope clinic. It happens here in our fellowship hall uh, once or twice a year. So there'll be ushers uh, passing plate for a free will offering. In the meantime, any questions, and I'll pad, pass you the mic. Thank you so much, Dr. Greger, for being here. In your first book, How Not to Die, I was so happy to read that consumption of nuts does not promote weight gain, because I love my nuts. <laughs> I'm nuts for nuts. However, today's lecture, I haven't read the new book yet. Is there discussion of that in the new book? And does this mean no more nuts? Um, I do indeed have a whole section on nuts in the new book. Um, you know, nut consumption. Uh, so nuts are one of the healthiest foods out there. In fact, you know, Walt Willett, the most uh, cited nutrition professional in human history, uh, who was chair of the Harvard Nutrition Department, was asked what uh, some of the greatest nutrition discoveries were um, of his lifetime, um, and he said, the discovery from the Adventist studies that nuts were so good for us, one of two foods um, alone associated with literally adding years to one's life. Nuts, an ounce a day, a palm full a day of nuts, or dark green leafy vegetables. The only two foods that have been shown alone, regardless of what else is eaten, um, adding literally years to one's life. Um, so there will be future discussion of nuts in my next book, How Not to Age, which will be out in December 2022. But, okay, the critical piece that this book adds, the weight loss book adds, that How Not to Die doesn't, is we want to eat our nuts whole or chopped up, not as nut butters or seed butters. Because, again, we are walling off our calories. And so nuts, no matter how well you chew them, end up with these little microscopic particles, or even less microscopic particles, um, that then pass right through you, um, it containing tens of thousands of little oil-filled cells that never make it into your body. Um, and so, uh, you know, a calorie may still be a calorie circling your toilet bowl, but it's not going to end up on your hips. Um, and so any, you look at a, at a nutrition label of a, you know, a bag of nuts or whatever, um, you can take 20% off. 20% off any calories. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why you don't get the expected weight gain. You would be eating nuts. However, not the same with almond butter or peanut butter or tahini or the, because then you get all the calories um, because you've broken open all those cell walls. Um, and so that would be the difference. And so in How Not to Die, so from, from a longevity standpoint, it doesn't matter if you eat almond butter or almonds. Um, but from a weight loss standpoint, if you're trying to lose weight, I would stick to the almonds and not the almond butter. Hi, Dr. Greger. Uh, James Tice. Right in the middle. Right in the middle. Ah! I met you in San Diego, and I told you about uh, my group, Intermittent Fasting for Vegans. And um, they had one question that they wanted me to ask you, and I didn't. Uh, I, it's 90% uh, female, and they want to know dietarily what they can do from perimenopause through menopause and beyond other than HRT or yeah. black cohosh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so first of all, just in terms of intermittent fasting, it's the largest uh, chapter in my book is actually on intermittent fasting where I talk about all the different types. 
um, some of which good, some of which bad. Um, but uh, no, but in terms of what we can do during perimenopause for combating the symptoms of menopause, um, soy foods. Um, and so, I mean, there's a reason why in Japan, which is the country with the highest soy consumption on average in the world, has no, uh, has no word in the Japanese language for hot flashes because it's just not something um, that they have to deal with. And so we do these randomized controlled studies where we can prove we can significantly decrease hot flashes by eating soy foods. Now, there are healthier or less healthy soy foods. My preference would be whole soy foods, so that's either like a can of soybeans, or edamame, the immature green soybeans still in the pod, or miso or tempeh, where you can see the individual soybeans in there, as opposed to something like soy milk or tofu, which still would actually help with menopausal symptoms just as well, because it's actually the isoflavones, which are found in all soy foods, but um, uh, less healthy, just they have less fiber, they're just not as, um, I would prefer people to eat whole foods if, if however possible for the other benefits, but for the uh, menopausal benefits, any kind of uh, uh, soy food will do. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so this is kind of an unusual, so when high fat, high protein foods are exposed to high dry heat temperatures, such as broiling, barbecuing, baking, um, so anything basically above kind of steaming or boiling, um, you produce these compounds called advanced glycation end products. Um, uh, the so-called glycotoxins are not good for you for a variety of reasons. It's got a bunch of videos on that. Um, and so, but that's not a problem. So you look at the list, of, so in How Not to Die, I list the top 20 food, top 20 um, most concentrated sources of AGs. Number one is broiled hot dogs and, and then McDonald's nuggets, and um, it goes down on the list. And, and they're all, of course, animal foods. But there are some rare plant foods that actually have a combination of high protein, high fat, like tofu. We should not Cajun blacken our tofu. Um, we should not broil our tofu, um, deep fry our tofu, um, because we get those same kind of products that are, that are created. And the same thing with nuts. We really shouldn't um, uh, we shouldn't uh, toast our nuts. As delicious as toasted nuts are, we should try to eat our nuts and nut butters raw. Thanks to these advanced glycation end products. So happy to help. Best in our community. And um, my question to you is maybe not so much health oriented, but in the sense that you've obviously been able to. Um, cultivate an ability to communicate the message of health um, to quite an extent. And I would love if you could maybe share with us what separates your journey of communicating your health message as opposed to the rest of the medical community that seems to um, not be able to elicit that same ability and therefore not getting such a message across and pervasive in the community. Um, it is all, so the question uh, was just, uh, you know, uh, effective communication, and it's really practice. It is practice. So this year, I've got, uh, I'm speaking in 200 cities over 10 months. I've been doing, I've been on the road uh, basically since 2001. And so I am embarrassed looking at some of these early tapes of me like a decade ago. I'm like, oh, God, that was terrible. And maybe in 10 years' time, I'll look back and be like, oh, God, 2020, I was terrible. Um, but yeah, you just you get better at it. Um, so public speaking is just like anything else, um, you know. And soon, hopefully, I'll have all these notes memorized and can really, you know. But this is a new talk, so it'll take me a while. But um, yeah, no. So so anything you're passionate about, just regardless of what any kind of inherent skill you have, you just do it a bunch and bunch of times, and you'll just get good at it by default, by accident, whether you like it or not. It's just what happens. Our bodies are amazing. Hi, Dr. Gregor. I'm short over here. <laughs> um, I, I noticed that, or maybe noticed that there wasn't a lot spoken about organic, but um, mm. I'm guessing there's a lot of research out there. Can you speak a little? To oh, that? absolutely. So here I am telling people to eat lots of fruits and vegetables, um, but what about organic versus conventional? Well, in How Not to Die, I talk about its modeling study, um, which suggested that if half of Americans ate just a single serving of fruits or vegetables a day, more, then every year we would prevent 10,000 cases of cancer. Isn't that amazing? That's how powerful produce is. But 
because they're talking about conventional fruits and vegetables, pesticide-laden fruits and vegetables, the additional pesticide burden on the American public would cause 10 cases of cancer. So overall, we would just prevent 19,990 cases of cancer. That gives you the idea of the tremendous benefit of eating fruits and vegetables versus the tiny bump in risk. Now you say, hey, why accept any risk at all? Choose organic, get all benefits, no risk. Great, but we should never let concern over pesticides prevent us from stuffing our face with as many fruits and vegetables as possible. Regarding, um, if you don't have a gallbladder, mm. um, the, does that ha have any effect in digesting plant-based diet? Um, so uh, if you don't have a gallbladder, then it makes it more difficult to digest fats. But since most plant foods are low in fat, that would be a perfect diet for someone to follow who did not have a gallbladder. Right here, right here. Oh, yeah, woohoo! Hello, Dr. Greger, and God bless you, and thank you for being here, and thank you, everybody, for being here, and God bless you all. Um, you know, my question is, do, is there hope for us that are vegan, vegetarian women that, you know, there's a big talk on osteoporosis and rheumatoid arthritis and all this kind of thing. What kind of hope do we have by sticking to the nuts, grains, fruits, and vegetables balance-wise? And what are the studies showing as compared to the women that, because our country is inundated with this right now. We, you know, like our rich country with all this rich food, and yet we have a terrible problem with osteoporosis and rheumatoid arthritis. And I just wanted to know what hope we have and what you can see that we can prevent. I kind of looked through your book kind of looking for that. And so I was just hoping that, I don't know if your new edition maybe has more on that subject. Thank you. So if you go to nutritionfacts.org, all my work is available free there, over 2,000 videos, and I've got a bunch, at least a half dozen on, specifically rheumatoid arthritis. Not, about, not only talking about prevention, but actually treating rheumatoid arthritis, and what's one of the most powerful interventions we have in our medical armamentarium? A plant-based diet. Um, significantly improving not, not just things like grip strength and morning stiffness, but improvements of objective laboratory measures of inflammation by people switching to an anti-inflammatory diet. Plant-based diet is effectively synonymous with a uh, with, uh, plant-based diet. Um, uh, and so in terms of, uh, uh, and, and that goes for all autoimmune diseases um, that have been looked at so far. Um, including Crohn's disease, uh, autoimmune inflammatory bowel disease. We now have data on, on, uh, on ulcerative colitis and ankylosing spondylo um, uh, spondylosis and uh, lupus um, and multiple sclerosis. In fact, the most uh, effective um, intervention ever published in the medical literature on multiple sclerosis, plant-based diet. Um, uh, and same thing with Crohn's disease. Nothing has ever worked better. No drug, um, no surgical intervention has ever worked better in terms of relapse prevention over two years than a plant-based diet. Um, so um, any, and because inflammation plays uh, a, a role in many of our chronic diseases like diabetes and, and heart disease, no wonder why an anti-inflammatory diet, a plant-based diet is so effective against a whole broad range um, of diseases why, you know, a, a heart healthy diet is a brain healthy diet, is a kidney healthy diet, is a liver healthy diet, it's the same diet because it's an anti-inflammatory diet as well as it's a, uh, a, a diet that helps clean out your arteries and all of our organs need adequate oxygen and blood flow and nutrients and getting rid of waste products, etc. So no surprise. Um, in terms of osteoporosis, um, the rates of osteoporosis don't differ um, between um, uh, 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 women, for example, drinking milk, not drinking milk, hip fracture rates aren't the same, and they're all pretty miserable, and that's because of our sedentary lifestyles. It's use it or lose it. And the reason why astronauts lose about 2% of their skeletal mass every month is because their body is floating around thinking, why am I wasting all this time making bone if you're not going to use it? Um, you know, it's like if you have your arm in a cast and your muscle just withers away. Again, your body's like, why am I making a muscle? You're not going to use it. I'm not stupid. Um, and, I mean, people think of, uh, like, skeletons as kind of just an inanimate structure. But no, bones are living, breathing, bleeding organs that are constantly being remodeled. Um, and so if we're sitting on the couch all day, our body says, i got better things to do. Um, that's why weight-bearing exercise is critical. 
at least an hour a day, every single day, seven days a week. And if you're super skinny and light, um, then you should put on a weight vest or a backpack when you're out there um, uh, um, uh, putting stress on your bones. Because all of a sudden, your, your body says, oh, I just gained 40 pounds. Oh my god, quick! We need a stronger skeleton ASAP. And, we, and we'll build the strong skeleton as your body needs. Um, but so that, that's probably the most important thing. Of course, you need a minimum of bone building nutrients, like you know, 600 milligrams of calcium every day. You need vitamin D, um, which shouldn't be uh, a problem um, at this latitude, getting enough adequate uh, sunshine. Um, but the critical thing is, I mean, all the calcium in the world isn't going to matter if your body's like, I've got other priorities. Yeah, can you just talk a little bit about the uh, new plant-based uh, burgers that the major fast food restaurants? Yeah. yeah, yeah, so I mean, I made a little note about it. So yeah, there's like the Impossible Whopper and the, uh, the Beyond Meat Burger. I mean, all these, these fast food chains are scrambling to come up with plant-based options. Really quite remarkable. I think that what you, I mean, the fact that Burger King has ads on TV saying, you know, 100% Whopper, 0% beef. They are bragging that their new burger, no meat, no meat at all. Um, and that just speaks, I think, to this remarkable societal in surge in interest into plant-based eating. Um, and so I see these foods as transitional foods, as stepping stone foods um, uh, on moving towards a healthier diet. I just don't want people to stall there. I mean, look, not everyone can go kale quinoa overnight. I understand that. So I mean, these are great that you have these foods to help people along their journey. But I just you know, want people to continue moving towards whole, um, uh, whole intact plant foods. You know, so like that, the Adventist study showed that in terms of childhood obesity rates, um, you know, plant-based meats cut risk in half of um, uh, cut the odds of children becoming overweight in half compared to regular meat. So, you know, veggie burgers compared to regular burgers, half of the odds of school children becoming overweight. But beans were a quarter. Um, and so, um, so, you know, having a bean burrito, uh, so beef burrito, beyond meat burrito, bean burrito, um, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a whole nother a um, uh, whole nother step down. So these are all steps in the right direction, but I think it's just a remarkable, very, um, uh, very positive sign that finally um, uh, the uh, society is catching on. And of course, look, the junk food industry will be happy to fight any kind of junk food we want. We want low-fat junk food, they'll give us snack well cookies. You know, we want high-fat junk, keto junk food, ironically, paleo junk food. They'll give you any kind of junk food they want. What they can't give you, what they can't make money off of is real food. Because right, real food goes bad. Um, produce is the worst possible thing to sell. It goes bad. You can't patent it. You can't brand it. You're never going to see an ad on TV for sweet potatoes. Um, <laughs> that lasts on the shelf. for a few, you know, Great for shelf life, not good for human life. Or you sell brown sugar water. Oh my god, how brilliant is that? You add some caffeine to make it addictive. Oh my god, this is awesome. It's pure And that sugar? Taxpayer subsidized sugar. Oh my God! I mean, it's like perfect. Um, same thing. Taxpayer subsidized feed crops to make dollar menu burgers. I mean, this is the system is set up to make us unhealthy, and it's not some grand conspiracy, right? The the, the CEO of Coca Cola is not, you know rubbing their sticky hands together, thinking, how can I contribute to the childhood obesity epidemic? They've got stockholders, and every quarter they have to show returns. And how do you do that? You do it selling bad food. Um, so the system is just set up. So that's why we need to reclaim our health. We're not, you know, we're not going to hear it necessarily um, from, you know, on, on TV kind of regular sources because that, that, that's not profitable. But so we need to kind of reclaim our own health. Um, uh, we can't wait till society catches up to the science because it's a matter of life and death. Though society is apparently catching up. Yes. I watch a lot of YouTube videos uh, from uh, nutrition experts. I watch yours often and other uh, nutrition experts' videos. And there appears to be a controversy about uh, omega-3 fatty acids and uh, you know, the best sources and do we need to supplement that and so on. So could you comment on that, please? Yeah, so I don't think the literature is, is necessarily controversial. Most uh, nutrition so-called controversies are really manufactured controversies. Um, and that, and that it's actually really quite clear. So there's really a consensus, nutritional consensus, going back decades on the key tenets of healthy eating and healthy living. 
Um, and so I'd recommend people go, for example, to the truehealthinitiative.org, which is a consensus statement of hundreds of the top nutrition researchers in the world. It's kind of like um, uh, the IPCC, the climate change group of climate change experts, where like, j they just agree on a consensus statement. This is what the experts say. But there's a similar thing for nutrition, the True Health Initiative. Uh, thanks to David Katz at uh, Yale. Um, we're indebted to him for that, to providing us that resource. Um, and so, if you're so, anytime you hear of one of these controversies, you can always go, "Well, let, what do the what do the true experts really think about this?" Uh, but in terms of omega threes, so our um, omega three fats are essential fats, meaning we have to get them into our diet. And so, we can uh, eat the plant based, the short chain omega threes, these alpha linolenic acid found in walnuts and chia seeds and flax seeds. Um, one of the reasons I encourage people, part of my daily dozen, is a tablespoon of ground flax seeds every day because we want to get that you know, 2.2 grams of, uh, of ALA into one's diet. Then our body can then elongate that short chain omega-3s into the long chain omega-3s that are found in fish fat, EPA, DHA, which is important for brain health. So we used to think that those long chain omega-3s were important for cardiovascular disease health, um, uh, but, uh, uh, but, and that's where this idea that fish oil and advice for eating fatty fish came from, that has since been dismissed. Um, if you look at, for example, the latest Cochrane review, which is the gold standard for evidence-based medicine, no benefit for eating, for taking fish oil in terms of cardiovascular health, um, heart attacks or strokes, either primary prevention, secondary prevention, no benefit from giving people advice to eat fatty fish, et cetera. Um, but for long-term cognitive health, particularly in older men, the question is, uh, for those not eating fish, are they going to be able to elongate? Is your body's going to make, be able to make enough of those long-chain omega-3 fatty acids for optimal health? And that's an unanswered research question. Um, but we do have evidence, including randomized controlled trials, showing um, uh, a significant improvement in cognitive health if you give people this algae-based um, DHA, which is a pollutant-free DHA. That's where the fish get it from in the first place, right? These are essential fats. We can't make them. The fish can't make them either. They get them from the bottom of the food chain, which is these algae in the ocean, um, which then build up. So we can kind of cut out the middle fish by going straight to a pollutant-free source um, and, and show significant improvement in cognitive health. So I do recommend people consider 250 milligrams of a pollutant-free um, DHA every day. And so that's either an algae or yeast-based DHA. Dr. Greger. Um, yeah, you've been uh, fighting big corporation, um, big food, big profit for decades. I want to thank you very much for your efforts. Um, and this is a worldwide fight. And still, for the mass of the population, the health outcomes seem to still be declining. It seems like f for every gain out there in, in, in health and in diet, it's after an intense, bloody um, battle. And I just wanted to see, do you see any good long-term trends, or is it always going to be this hard? You know, when are we going to start making some real traction in the, in the Yeah, effort? now anyone who wonders what kind of traction we're making has not been in this movement for long. For those of us who've been involved in this evidence-based nutrition movement for decades, right, you, we see this tremendous surge in interest never before like if i told you kentucky fried chicken has this new plant-based yeah i mean that, what are you crazy i mean if, if i told you oh remember elsie the cow borden dairy oh they're going out a bit they're bankrupt um because you know everyone's drinking almond milk and i mean what i mean it's amazing um so i mean there's just uh never before has i seen such tremendous movement and it all looks good and of course the industry is going to be fighting tooth and nail um, and there's like all these labeling laws, like you can't, like, so there's these, the, the, these, the, the dairy industry, talk about desperation. They're trying to pass state laws saying you can't call almond milk milk, right? So you have to call it like almond non-dairy beverage or something like that, right? I mean, like that's how, that's what, that, that, like, that's, how, that's how backed in the corner they are. Um, and so, I mean, I think that's just, uh, so it's all good news for the floor, uh, you know, for, uh, now having said that, not to be too Pollyanna, literally hundreds of thousands of Americans continue to die every year needlessly because they just don't have this knowledge in their hands and that's why it's up to all of us to get out there and educate our um, uh, friends, family, and community members. Thank you for being here. And our question is about coconut oil. Don't do it. Um, no, 
Having said that, you can actually put it on your skin, you can put it in your hair. So topically it's fine, except in infants, because infants have such permeable skin, you can actually get an increase in saturated fats within their body if you massage an infant with coconut oil. But, um, but, it's, but past infancy, past year one, um, you can slather it all you want, just don't get it in your mouth. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, okay, it's working. So my first question is, I have two kind of short ones, but I kind of look around and I feel like I'm like the only college student kind of here. So I was wondering what you think, or maybe there's four, oh, four oh, I don't know. Oh. But, um, yeah. <laughs> but um, how do you think, like, what would you suggest to get this, like, to see more college people or, like, the youth in here and, like, caring about that and mm. this and, like, more knowledge and being able to, like, talk about that yeah. and then my second question is I was looking at a lot of the pictures that you had and they were very kind of sciencey and I'm a philosophy major and I'm really interested in all this stuff and want to be involved but when I when I think about how to get in there I'm like I kind of feel like if you're looking at a resume or something you pick like bio or like philosophy so do you have any suggestions for maybe like liberal arts people oh. to oh, yeah. get involved yeah oh that's great questions um, and so, and for the first thing, in terms of um, getting, getting young folks interested in this message, you don't give a talk about, you know, about heart disease, right? You don't give a, talk, a health talk. Today, the number one reason why young people are transitioning towards eating healthier is because of climate change, because of concern over the environment, um, also concern over um, animal suffering. Um, and so that's what really grabs these young idealistic folks is that they're actually changing their eating habits, day-to-day -day eating habits, because they care about carbon, because they care about, they see what's happening in Australia and they don't want to contribute to that. They see what's happening in the Amazon, they don't want to contribute to that. And so that's really, so they, I mean, so the talks I give about chronic disease prevention, you know, young folks are not thinking about, you know, uh, I mean, there are some health things you can grab young people on, like acne and athletic performance and things like that. but. Um, but yeah, so, so yeah, so the chronic disease is, is for uh, typically an older crowd because they're all of a sudden they're getting diagnoses and they're seeing their friends get sick and so, you know, anyway. Um, so it would be a different message. So for example, uh, anyone see the new documentary Game Changers? Ah, yeah. Oh, yeah, see, there we go. So now that is, I think, a message geared towards kind of a younger uh, demographic. Um, and so, yeah, so there's wonderful resources out there. Um, I think it's just a different angle. Uh, may be a little more attractive for folks. And in terms of kind of career paths um, forward to be involved in this, you know, one of the most exciting things happening these days is ironically the business sector. You know, so someone noted about, oh, the, you know, evil corporations. But, you know, I mean, uh, you know, some of these, uh, some of these self-insuring corporations um, who pay their own employees health care they are leading the fight for plant-based nutrition. So, I mean, I was, you know, I was just at this, uh, there's this diesel engine company called Cummins. They're like this multi-billion dollar company. They have tens of thousands of employees. And they just opened a plant-based clinic. They have my books and all their, 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 their waiting rooms, you know. And I went there to talk to their physicians about it. Why are they doing this? Now the CEO says, well, I care about my employees. I, cynically, <laughs> I'm thinking you care about your bottom line, but you prevent a few cases of diabetes and you just save yourself tons of money, right? General Motors spends more money on healthcare than they do on steel. Um, I mean, it was just bleeding these companies dry. And so they're actually leading the charge. Um, um, and then there's all these new plant-based, you know, you know the, the, when Beyond Meat, when the IPO went public. I mean, it's huge interest um, in you know, finding ways to get people eating healthier. And so I think there's tremendous opportunities in the for-profit sector, the non-profit sector. Um, basically, anything you're good at, anything you enjoy doing, think will help the world. That's what you should um, move. And there's room for philosophers, too. <laughs> uh, last question. Dr. Greger has to be in Camarillo this afternoon to speak. These are great questions. It's a lot of fun hearing your answers. Who's got the best Last question. Oh, pressure's on! Go ahead, Hi, my name is Jennifer. I'm so grateful to be here in your presence. So, are you ever going to do a video, What I Eat in a Day? Oh. And what do you eat in a day to hit all these targets that you talk about? Um, and do you ever add any kind of oil? And if so, what kind? What? Well, it depends what airport food court I find myself in, unfortunately. 
Um, though, uh, uh, no, so that, that's where the Daily Dozen came out of. And so anyone I wanted to know how I eat when I'm at home and actually have control over my diet um, is, uh, uh, is this Daily Dozen checklist of all the healthiest healthy foods I encourage people to eat in their diet, available free as an app iPhone, Android, Dr. Greg's Daily Dozen, you get it. It's a checklist, you can track your progress, graph your progress, see how you're doing every day. If one day you're not doing so great, just try to do better the next day. So it's, you know, eating uh, berries every day, the healthiest fruits, greens every day, the healthiest vegetables, tablespoon of ground flax seeds every day, quarter teaspoon of turmeric, the best beverages, the best sweeteners, you know, how much exercise to get every day. All, you know, and now I have the 20, now you can switch over to weight loss mode in the app and look at the 21 tweaks to accelerate weight loss. They got all those, oh my God, you're going to be checking boxes all day. But I mean, this is, and basically it's just to inspire people to try to, you know, um, uh, to kind of, you know, naturally kind of just crowd out some of the less healthy options in one's diet. Oh, and uh, you will notice there's not a checkbox for oil. Why? Because oil is the table sugar of the fat kingdom, right? You take something like a sugar beet, which is where most of our sugar comes from these days, you remove all the nutrition you just left with table sugar, sucrose, right? Um, same thing with oil. You take, an, you take a walnut, for example, you remove all the nutrition, um, all the fiber, all the minerals you're left with just the oil. Now it has some fat-soluble nutrients like vitamin E, but basically you've just stripped all the nutrition away and you've got empty calories. In fact, the most calorically dense food on the planet is oil, 120 calories per tablespoon. 120 calories, that could be a lot of food, but instead you're just making your food shiny. Thank you so much, everyone.